to Russia in the light of the recent crackdown on protesters and the opposition. I would like to remind members that for all debates of this part session there will be no catch the eye procedure and no blue cards will be accepted. Furthermore, as during the last part sessions, remote interventions from the Parliament's liaison offices in Member States are possible. I'd now like to give the floor to Mr Borrell. You have the floor, sir. Mr President, Honourable Members of the European Parliament, Russia-EU relations have come a full circle since the 1990 Paris Charter. This charter represented the equivalent of what we call the hand of the history after the fall of Berlin Wall. The vision of a common space from Lisbon to Vladivostok has not materialized. And Russia has not fulfilled the expectation of becoming a modern democracy. Instead, there is a deep disappointment and growing mistrust between the European Union and Russia. Many of the traditional pillars of the Russia-European relations are giving away. Conflicts in Ukraine, the situation in the South Caucasus, and moldova Transnistria are fooling EU-Russia tensions, but they are also their product. Belarus also. The Russo economic ties with Europe have been severely hit by the sanctions. Energy shipments that has been for decades the backbone of the strategic relationship between Moscow and Europe will be deeply affected by the greening of the world economy. Maybe during our discussions we can come to this issue. Political dialogue has come to a standstill since the 2014 conflict in Ukraine since then, the Russian economy has been shrinking. Today, the GNP per capita is 30% less. And the adversity of the present political climate makes values and principles a sore point once again. And then, there is the Navalny case. It is in this context that I decided to travel to Moscow last week. The purpose of the visit was twofold. First, to convey eye to eye, face to face, the European Union's position on matters of concern to us, human rights, political freedom, and the situation of Mr. Nalvani. This I did, and they didn't appreciate. The case of Alex Nalvani was at the center of my tense exchange with Minister Lavrov. Second, as part of the preparation of the discussion on the next European Council on Russia relation scheduled for the March, I also wanted to test if the Russian authorities are interested in a serious attempt to reverse the deterioration of our relations and seize the opportunity to have a more constructive dialogue? The answer has been clear. No, they are not. They are not if we continue to put the political situation and human rights issues in the package. But human rights is part of our ADN and we cannot refuse to talk about it. My visit included consultations with Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, meetings with civil society representatives, think tankers, and representatives of the European business, journalists, 
and a number of European Union ambassadors. And I also pay tribute to Boris Nemtsov, who was murdered six years ago, shot to death in a bridge near the Kremlin, and his tragic assassination, never clarified, was a warning of what we are seeing now. This travel was taking place in a particularly tense context. And this visit presented obvious risk. I took them. I took them on one hand because we condemn the handling of the Navalny affair. On the other hand, because it allowed me to assess firsthand the challenges of engaging with Russia. I had no illusion before the visit. I am even more worried after. What I take from my interaction? First, the Russian government is going down a worrisome authoritarian route. The space for civil society, freedom of expression continues to narrow, and there seems to be almost no room for development of democratic alternatives. The Russian authorities have shown in the Navalny case that they are merciless in stifling any such attempts. Indeed, the current power structure in Russia, I like to talk about the power structure in Russia, not about Russia, because Russia are the Russian people. The current power structure in Russia, combining vested economic interests, military and political control, leave no opening for democratic rule of law. The strong pushback on any discussion related to human rights and democratic values indicates this is considered for them as an existential threat. Second, the visit confirmed the long-running trend whereby Russia is disconnected from Europe, with little or no progress on conflicts in our common neighborhood. And as I said, they are disconnected because they consider our liberal democratic system as an existential threat for them. During my meeting with uh, Minister Lavrov, the discussion became heated as I called for Mr. Navalny's immediate and unconditional release, as well as for full and impartial investigation into his assassination attempt. I also asked him if I could meet Alexei Navalny. They addressed me to the court. It was impossible due to time constraints and the fact that Mr. Navalny was sitting in front of the court at that time. But a senior member of my delegation met with Mr. Navalny's lawyer during the visit, and we will continue maintaining contacts with the team to signify our support. We also had exchanges on foreign policy issues. I insisted on the need to advance towards full implementation of the Minsk Agreement, to fully respect Ukraine's territorial integrity, I underlined the need to heed the call of the people of Belarus to freely choose their president. However, on a few issues, notably on the GCPOA, we have managed to establish effective cooperation over the past years. There may be other issues, such as supporting Israel-Palestinian dialogue, where we could expand our engagement but the overall environment of the visit did not allow to explore this further. In my exchange, one thing became clear. There is no intention on the Russian side to engage in a constructive discussion if we address human rights and political freedom. The news of the expulsion of three diplomats on the basis of unfunded allegations came when we were ending our talks. And it didn't came by an announcement from the Russian side. We knew it through the networks. I understood it was a clear message. The meeting was over. 
I asked Mr. Lavrov to reverse this decision, but that not avail. Uh, that same night, I issued a statement denouncing such a confrontational move. Now, allow me to look at the conclusions I draw from the visit. I'm very concerned over the perspective of the Russian authorities' geostrategic choices and the implications of their action. They will have for us and for the Russian society. We are at a crossroad in our relation with Russia, and the choices that we will make will determine the international power dynamics on this century. And notably, whether we will advance towards a more cooperative or towards a more polarized models based on close or on free societies. First, we will discuss this issue at the Foreign Affairs Council on the next 22nd of February at the European Union Council in March. This will provide guidance on the way forward and it will be for the member states to decide the next step. But yes, this could include sanctions. And I will put forward concrete proposals using the right of initiative that the High Representative has. Containment efforts should include combining robust actions against disinformation, cyber attacks, and other possible hybrid challenges. Second, at the same time, despite any difficulty, it is of key importance to preserve a space for official engagement where it is in our interest. Russia remains our biggest neighbor. We must define a modus vivendi that will avoid permanent confrontation. And third, but not last, we must find a way to continue engaging with Russian society. Russians form mostly an European country, and an important part of the Russian population wishes to maintain strong links with the European Union and harbors genuine democratic aspirations. We should not turn our back to them. Maybe the Russian power wants to disengage, to disconnect from Europe, but we should not disconnect from the Russian civil society, from the Russian people. We have to find a way to advance on these issues, and in doing so, to preserve our unity and determination. Without unity, it will not be determination. And without determination, we will not be able to address a good policy. Russia has been trying to divide us, they seek to divide us. They haven't succeeded. On Ukraine and on human rights issues, they haven't succeeded on dividing us. This seemed to be a clear objective during my visit. We should not fail into these traps. On my side, Mr. President, honorable members, I will continue defending the need to speak and maintain channels of communication open looking at each other in the eyes, especially on issues that are conflictual. Defending Navalny's rights in Moscow when his trials, trial was unfolding is a way of showing that foreign policy cannot be reduced to issuing written statements from a safe distance from my office in the Berlin Mon or the external action service. I think it was uh, important to show our concerns directly, in person, at the right moment, and in the right place. I hope this discussion will provide alignment for the future decisions of the European Union Council and to look forward to how to handle our relationship with Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Borrell, for that contribution. 
that's time for those speakers on behalf of the groups. First of all, Mr. Gala for the EPP group. You have the floor. Kitos Poimes, dear colleagues, high representative. Your consultations in Moscow must serve as an eye opener for all those who had illusions about the real character and policies of the Kremlin. The visit as such, but especially the infamous press conference, sparked outrage among many of my colleagues in the EPP group, and you will hear it later. The behavior of Foreign Minister Lavrov was unfriendly, uncooperative and unacceptable. We duly noted that you put forward several points of our concern, the demand for the release of Alexei Navalny and the 10,000 arrested citizens, the Russian aggression in states of our immediate neighborhood. But was it not to be expected that Lavrov would produce an attack on the EU? It would have been appropriate to address the long list of Russian misbehavior in response and to rebuff Lavrov's whataboutism on Latvia, Cuba and Catalonia. Russia is the aggressor in Ukraine and elsewhere, not us. Russian authorities have people murdered at home and abroad, not us. Russia secures dictators in power, not us. Things are now crystal clear. No more wishful thinking, no more appeasement. This Russian leadership does not seek dialogue, even less so before the Duma elections. These Russian leaders are adversaries of the EU and want to divide us. We Europeans must now act together and defend our values and interests. We demand a clear message of unity and determination from the Council and our leaders. We expect member states to allow to make use of the European Magnitsky Act. You said you will initiate it. Thank you very much. Let every judge and prosecutor playing their role in political political trials against opposition and peaceful demonstrators feel they have booked a place on our sanctions list. And then grill the big fish, the profiteers and big supporters of the regime. Let them feel the same. No more trips to the EU. Asset freeze. Real anti-money laundering action in all of our member states. In parallel, let us step up support and dialogue with civil society. Our interest in cooperation was genuine, so must now be our resolve. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gala. Now for the S&D group, Katy Piri from The Hague. You have the floor. Thank you, President. What we witnessed in the case of Navalny is Kafka, Kafka year 2021. After having failed to kill him, he had to be put away. Navalny is seen as a threat because he puts his finger on the sore spot. Russians have enough of Putin's kleptocracy while ordinary people face economic hardships. Moscow abused the visit of High Representative Borrell to humiliate and offend the European Union. It expelled three diplomats during his visit and Lavrov called the EU an unreliable partner while Russia is doing everything to divide us. But to put the blame on Borrell for this, would it, had a, would it have also happened if the EU leaders would have taken a tougher stance? But instead, the Council so far failed to put any meaningful sanctions on Russia after the assassination attempt of Navalny. Orban prevented the EU from issuing a joint statement. The Cypriot government has been issuing golden passports to Kremlin and labelers for years. French President Macron just recently renewed his call for a dialogue with Moscow, and last Saturday, Moscow resumed work on Nord Stream 2 with the support of German Chancellor Merkel. Colleagues, what we need is a united strategy, strategy on Russia, not an appeasement in view of the challenges Russia is posing to our security. This means that the Council will have to come with clear and tough sanctions against Putin and his enablers, and I believe Mr. Borrell has drawn the same conclusions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Piri. Now for the Renew Group, Mr. Dachanchalos. Two minutes. International representant, visit. President, High Representative, your visit to Moscow at this moment was, in my opinion, a mistake. Proper attention wasn't paid to the fact that 
There was no room to act to put on pressure for Navalny to be liberated from prison. Of course, we want to maintain uh, diplomatic channels open, and I won't deny that. But an official visit to Russia, given the backdrop, given the tensions, takes on a symbolic value. We believe this visit has sent out the wrong diplomatic message. Consistency with the strong message that the European Union is sending out towards Russia is important for democracy, both in Russia and in the whole of the Eastern Partnership. You fell into a media trap in Moscow, um, one created by the Putin regime. Two days after Navalny's arrest and after the protests that we saw in the streets, Moscow has violated international law and the rights of its own citizens. There was an illegal annexation of Crimea. Um, there have been uh, cyber attacks against us. They've carried out assassinations on EU territory. It's launched a disinformation campaign against Europe. There are other ways for the external action service to act. It didn't make sense to carry out a visit given the conditions. Our visits have to be properly organized. Otherwise, um, as we know, Russia isn't interested in constructive relations with the EU. We want to create solid, credible uh, relations, uh, one which will have a proper influence. And the visit to Moscow and the consequences and fallout from it have sadly um, had a negative impact on the credibility of the EU in the diplomatic sector. Um, sadly, I think we all have to learn a lesson from what happened. Thank you very much, Mr. Cholosh. Next, for the ID group, Mr. Thierry Mariani. Two minutes. Monsieur le haut représentant. High representative, intellectually, we come from different political families. In this hemicycle, I've always pointed out that I didn't agree with all of your initiatives, but I want to pay tribute. Your trip to Moscow was realistic, necessary and courageous. Yes, I'm one of those who thinks that the EU cannot have no diplomacy. You said it yourself. All of your allies were against you, even though your diplomatic trip had not yet come to an end. And Atlanticism, people want to go back to the Cold War, all of that stops the EU from adopting a realistic policy today. So it's unlikely that you will be successful. Russia is constantly insulted by the European institutions, and that's no gift for you. That's why it was so necessary to take this risk and to go to Moscow and to speak to our Russian partners. That was why we had to end hypocrisy. If we look to the Atlantic, we also have to look to the, S, to the East, including as far as the Urals, as um, Charles de Gaulle said. We aren't naive. We know that Russia will continue to pursue its interests. We should stop representing other countries in our relations with Russia. It's about independence and dignity. If we say things simply, it means that we shouldn't make ourselves a laughing stock while uh, giving lessons to the rest of the world while reaching out a hand to Turkey. Germany knows what's happening with Russia because of Nord Stream. Uh, Europe is understanding this because we understand that the Sputnik vaccine may soon be necessary. Joe Biden said that America is back when he was sworn into office. We should say to that that Europe is free. Thank you very much, Mr. Mariani. Sorry. No heckling from the floor, please. And now, on behalf of the Green EFA group, Sergei Lagodinsky, one and a half minutes. In politics, we in the. In politics, as with diplomacy, personal experience 
is invaluable. You, Mr. Burrell, in recent days have had special personal experience. Luckily, these experiences were not comparable with the experiences of many Russian citizens who have been gathering their experience. Yes, Mr. Mariani, we are looking to Russia, all the way to Vladivostok. Who do we see there? We see people who are being arrested, who are being beaten. People like Kitaeva, who's a female activist, who was uh, stifled by a uh, with a plastic bag until she gave her PIN number for her uh, phone number. Uh, m a man who was uh, kicked uh, uh, in such a way that when he requested to complain to the police, he was kicked some more until he retracted the complaint. So your visit, Mr. Borrell, I think was sobering uh, for you, but for us, us as well, and for member states, for Berlin, for Paris, for the national governments uh, upon whose mandate you travel to Russia. So now it's high time that we go there and draw the conclusions. That's where the conclusions must be drawn. We have to stop trying to cooperate with Putin in some way. The travesty of Gerhard Schroeder. We have to make more offensive attacks on Russia. We have to think about sanctions. And yes, we have to think about stopping Nord Stream 2. I'm not just saying that to you not really to you, but actually to Berlin and to Paris, because that's where the people who are responsible for this are. Thank you very much, Mr. Lagodinsky. The next speaker on behalf of the ECR, Anna Fotiga. She will be speaking from Warsaw. President, Mr. Borrell, I reiterate my position delivered to you before this uh, unfortunate uh, visit. Uh, I maintain uh, this uh, position, of course. Um, your decision, actually under influence of, of major member states, Marcus Eder, uh, considered to be a so-called Russia understanding politician, and uh, advisors uh, within the Council and the Commission. Uh, you decided to go there and was led to, to a trap uh, carefully prepared by Sergei Wavrov. Uh, you decided to, to, to do this against advice of, of uh, countries of my region and politicians in the European Parliament over political divisions. Uh, you, by this uh, trip, you actually strengthened the regime in the run-up to parliamentary election and you denied a trace of hope for heavily fighting Russian opposition. Uh, you communicated your strong messages eye to eye, allowing Wavrov to, to deliver his lies and, and, and arrogance to millions of people all over the world, also seeing your humiliation in this effect. We know that you achieved something that is to, to boost your personal position, because your personal position in uh, attempts to, to, to reinvigorate JCPOA is well known. Uh, in, this, in this course of events, you decided to, to consult with Moscow rather than U.S., and uh, during uh, this uh, endeavor, you allowed Wavrov to, to, to actually offend our allies and our, our friends like Ukraine and, and, and others. It was really bad mistake. You have to, to, to uh, really improve this. Kiitos kollega, kollega Fotiga, teidän on nyt käytetty ja Thank you very much. Now for the left, Ms. Daly for one minute. And listening to the relentless Russia phobia in this place 
Why are people surprised that Russia sees no uh, point in engaging with the EU? I'm as happy as anybody else to stand up for anybody's rights, including Navalny's. But let's be honest about him. He's a vicious anti-immigrant racist on maybe 4% of the support in rallying hundreds and thousands in cities of millions, hardly a mass movement. And we wouldn't be discussing him at all if he'd been arrested anywhere else other than in Russia. Meanwhile, Julian Assange has been incarcerated for almost 10 years for exposing US war crimes. We can't mention his name. Tomorrow, Pablo Hassel, a Catalan rapper, is going to prison for his lyrics. Where's the call to sanction Spain? Tomorrow, 62-year-old Claire Grady is going to prison in West Virginia for her role in the non-violent plowshare action against Trident. Where's the demand to break off links with the US? Or the outcry about the hundreds of people arrested in this city on a Trump protest a week ago? Nowhere, because this isn't about human rights. This is a geopolitical agenda against Russia, fueled by a military-industrial complex who need an enemy to justify their millions. Of course you're right to go to Russia. We should be engaged in dialogue, not war. Thank you very much. Can everyone remain calm, though? It's extremely important that other speakers are respected. I now give the floor to Mr. Puigdemont, from the non-attached, you have one minute. Thank you, Chair. You, Mr. Borrell, should have told Minister Lavrov that he is wrong, that Spain does not have three political prisoners, but nine has nine, that it cannot be compared to Navalny because he has been sentenced to three years and a half in prison, and the Catalan leaders have been sentenced from nine to 13 years in prison for organizing a referendum. We have warned that the double standard applied by the EU undermines its global credibility as a defender of freedoms. There are no humiliating consequences for all. The EU cannot go around the world recommending receipts that does not apply to itself. I want a Europe with a strong voice for human rights and without complexes in front of anyone, not only in front of Russia, not only in front of United States, China, Morocco, or Turkey, but with anyone. You are not that voice, Mr. Borrell. Mr. Borrell, please do a Borrell exit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Puigdemont. Then we have further MEPs. Next, we have Mr. Sikorski. You have two minutes and you're speaking from Warsaw. Over to you, sir. Madam President, uh, colleagues, High Representative, let's remember that the uh, main uh, blame for the fiasco of this visit is on Russia. It is Russia that was rude and perfidious towards our High Representative. But nevertheless, this visit was a mistake. It, this was predictable and it was predicted and you didn't go with the full support of all the member states. And if you wanted to uh, hear what you heard from Mr. Lavrov, you could have met him on the margins of OSCE or, or the UN, where the environment would not have been controlled by the Russians. They just obviously can't help but show uh, their bad manners towards Western representatives. Uh, we are not supplicants of Russia. It is Russia that needs the lifting of our sanctions. And while Russia is still occupying the territory of its neighbors, while it's murdering people in our streets, while it's interfering in our political processes, and above all, while it's uh, repressing its own people, this was not a good time to go. We need a sign from Russia that they are willing to change their policy. And then, of course, we should always um, show them the so-called off-ramp towards, um, from, away from uh, authoritarianism. Um, but I hope that this experience um, 
has um, inspired you to, uh, for better understanding of us in Central Europe, and I'm counting on you to support sanctions against Russia while their bad behavior continues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sikorsky. I now give the floor to Mr. Pichula. One and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. High Representative. Human rights situation in Russia is deteriorating at unprecedented scale. Thousands of peaceful protesters are being detained and their right to demonstrate is being suppressed without valid legal arguments. Large-scale, countrywide demonstrations create internal problems that are always easiest to externalize. As we witnessed last week, Russia is not open towards hearing the facts being raised directly, neither by their citizens nor by foreign representatives. It's easy to conclude that our relations with Russia are at very low point. We should put in use additional targeted sanctions measures through a global human rights sanction mechanism and continue seeking for options on how to assist better civil society organizations. Finally, we have to adopt a new substantial and comprehensive strategy towards Russia. While working on it, you should not keep falling into political traps, further narrowing space for our political actions, but rather strengthen common foreign and security policy. Energy over-dependence, divergent strategies of the member states towards vaccine, Russia's very active role with disinformation campaigns and support to anti-European forces should be on our to-do list for the next Council meeting. Prevailing particular interests are only a great opportunity for Russia to impose further leverage. We should re-examine and put an end to the ongoing projects that undermine the credibility of the European Union as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pichula. The next speaker on the list is Mr. Geta for one and a half minutes and is speaking to us from Paris. Thank you, Madam President. With just an ounce of intelligence, he could have understood the message that the very visit of Joseph Borrell brought with it. With an ounce of finesse or lucidity, he would, could have understood that obviously we condemn in no uncertain terms and we continue con condemn the judicial harassment that's been inflicted on Alexei Navalny and the arrest of protesters that, he's, that support him. But nevertheless, we still want to keep our bridges open with Russia, especially on Iran. There's nothing more legitimate or easy to understand than that position. But what Mr. Putin understood is that he needs to behave like a little playground bully to demand to the world and to the rest of Russia that he's not scared of us. But I'm sorry, Mr. Putin, you failed in behaving in such a way. You've merely shown that your panic, which now blinds you because the Russian opposition has found its figurehead, because you're losing a footing in the states that left your ancient empire and because your popularity is waning and your coffers are emptying uh, because of this tete-a-tete -tete with China that nobody wanted because of your blindness. Nobody wanted that. None of the rich, the oligarchs, the security forces, the middle classes. You're losing control, Mr. Putin. And while you're at the end of your reign may be long and painful, it has begun. You opened it yourself with your obvious panic. Thank you very much, Mr. Geta. Now, the next speaker on the list is Mr. Demand for one and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you, President. The EU High Representative wanted to teach the Russians a, a lesson, but it was a ban visit. Mr. Lavrov quite simply knew that the EU didn't have the possibility to meddle in the internal affairs of Russia, and there is a principle that uh, this is not how diplomatic relations can work. Well, it was a bit embarrassing, but moreover, Mr. Borrell and the Spanish socialists refused to see uh, the situation as it is in terms of arresting protesters. It was a clear nyet from President Putin, 
who has been elected with 76% of the uh, uh, electorate, more than any other head of state or government can claim in the EU. In the meantime, in the same EU, you have Catalan politicians who are thrown in prison. They're not even allowed to take their seat in Parliament here, having been elected, and that with the agreement of the President of this Parliament, who also happens to be a socialist. And when it comes to the principle of the right to assemble, right to demonstrate, in my country, last week, 500 people were arrested because they were protesting against the uh, prevention of allowing people freedom be with the pretext of corona. As violence has been used against innocent pro protesters who are f fighting for their rights. I would say, colleagues, I would say, Mr. Burrell, sort out your own garden before you start waving a morally, uh, moral uh, finger at somebody else. Thank you, Mr. Deman. The next speaker is MEP Grigorova from Prague. One minute. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Borrell, I don't have questions for you that you won't answer me anyway anymore. Instead, I want to speak about what is important right now. The thousands of Russians in the streets being beaten and detained, and many more of them that don't want a corrupted government and hoped for support from the international community. With your ill-executed visit, you not only ashamed the European citizens, you also helped Putin and harmed the Russian people. You provided a mafia state with more images and sound bites to make us look weak and corrupt and make the Kremlin's regime look legitimate. You also failed to visit Navalny or at least support him during his trial, a missed opportunity to back up EU's strong claims about this case and to bring at least a little dignity to this visit. For this public damage, you should step down from your post immediately. Thank you very much, Ms. Grigorova. The next speaker is MEP Zlotowski for two minutes, please. Kitos. I would have preferred that your visit uh, to Russia was due to your lack of experience, but not a conviction that you can uh, persuade Putin to do anything. Uh, we knew that this visit would harm our policy of sanctions, that which wasn't uh, perfect, but at least uh, it was decisive and uh, considered. Now, you have destroyed uh, this policy. Uh, despite of all the atrocities and uh, violations, uh, it seems that we are uh, ready to normalize our relations with Russia. Did you talk to Minister Wavrov on cooperation uh, on uh, cybersecurity at the moment when uh, Russian uh, hackers are um, attacking us uh, every uh, month? In the past, Mikołajczyk, uh, Polish uh, Prime Minister, uh, was uh, also uh, treated uh, similarly, but at least uh, he um, delayed uh, an attack on Poland. Uh, at the time when you were uh, seeing uh, um, Wawrow, three uh, European Union diplomats uh, um, were uh, were expelled. Thank you very much, Ms. Lato Mrs. Lotowski. Now, Ms. Modig. Thank you, Chair. The free 
free opposition, free civil society don't exist in Russia. This visit has unfortunately shown what is happening with political leadership in that country. Uh, there's a slip towards authoritarianism. But we must seek out dialogue. We must fight for human rights. It doesn't matter who the partner is. There's no doubt about that. But we must also fight for the freeing of Navalny and support the opposition. The Russians must be able to choose their leadership freely and fairly. Basic fundamental rights need to be upheld. That's why we have charters and treaties. There can be no other political direction. We have to always fight for human rights, whatever the circumstances. Kiitos, kollega Modig. Thank you very much, Ms. Modig. The next speaker is MEP Rook Maka. One minute. Dear Mr. Borrell, dear colleagues, opposition leader Navalny shows immense courage testing the waning leadership of Putin. This brave man and the entire opposition need our full support. Mr. Borrell, and the, on the other hand, made a fool of himself last week in Moscow. By his actions, he made a mockery of the ambition of the EU to play a major role on the world stage. His actions are, I'm sorry to say, in line with several recent ill-considered actions of the Commission. However, let us remember, we are able to criticize our political leaders freely, a right that every human has, but in many countries is trample, trampled on by so-called political leaders and tyrants. Mr. Navalny is on a mission. He should have our support. The unfortunate actions of Mr. Borrell must not distract us from the principle that is at stake here, freedom. Thank you. Kiitos, kollega Rookmaker. Ja nyt haluan... Thank you, MEP Rookmaker. The next on the list is Paolo Rangel for two minutes. Madam President, Mr. High Commissioner, High Representative, we strongly condemn the decision to prosecute Alexei Navalny. We strongly condemn the attempt to murder Navalny. We strongly condemn the repression of demonstrations that took place all across the territory of Russia. We strongly condemn the unacceptable expulsion of three European Union diplomats. And we strongly condemn the cynical attitude of Foreign Minister Lavrov. We praise the courage and the resilience of the Russian people of the Russian opposition, of the Russian civil society. We praise in particular the courage of Alexei Navalny, of his family, of his supporters. High Representative Mr. Joseph Borrell, because we strongly condemn Russian authorities' behavior and their authoritarian regime, because we praise the extraordinary bravery of the Russian people and oppositionists, we deeply regret your vision and your actions in such an important, decisive and sensitive file. We deeply regret your decision to go to Moscow. We deeply regret your unfortunate and condescending declarations. We deeply regret that you did not have the courage to face Hi to hi, Mr. Lavrov's unacceptable stance. Mr. Borrell, don't get us wrong. The European Union peoples and this House, the European Parliament, will never give up. We will be always on the side of the Russian people's aspiration for freedom and democracy. For some reason, our human rights prize is Sakharov, surprise, uh, Sakharov Prize. We shall never surrender. Thank 
Kitos, kollega Ra- Thank you very much, Mr. Rangel. The next speaker on the list is Mr. Sanchez Amor for one minute. Presidenta, Señor Borrell. President, Mr. Borrell. We're talking more about Mr. Borrell than we are about Russia, which I'm sure the Kremlin will be the Kremlin will be very happy about. We the um, letter asking for Mr. Borrell to stand down is a success for Putin, and so its author should think about that. We have to be realistic. We have to um, remember our values and those of Navalny. We are a um, mature um, European democracy, and we have to use um, the correct tools of power, uh, both when it comes, uh, including when it comes to difficult situations like this one. We have to think about our response, but we also can't uh, repeat the same mistakes, which would just feed into what Russia wants. When the EU uh, had problems with AstraZeneca, we showed um, strength and unity. Um, was uh, we have to be careful because otherwise um, we can't allow other pharmaceuticals and we can't allow this um, to damage the um, image of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanchez and more. The next speaker on the list is Ms. Valkmans for one and a half minutes. Thank you very much. Mr. Borrell, Mr. Borrell, do you know how a beer is stained? Once you try, you better be prepared by bringing a pot of honey and a big stick. Because the moment the beer senses that you're not in control, he attacks. If you're lucky, the beer only hurts you badly. But often, their attacks are lethal. Last Friday, the Russian beer has badly roughed you up. Your disastrous visit to Moscow has damaged you personally. But even worse is the damage done to the EU as a whole. We have never looked so weak and clueless about how to deal with Russia. I even fear that our relations with Russia are worse than before your visit, and that's not good. There are colleagues in this house who want to finish the bear's job and send you home. I don't think you must step down. But today, it's clear that the Parliament is giving you a yellow card. Let this humiliating experience be a lesson. We must agree, colleagues, on a clear strategy on how to engage with Russia. A strategy supported by both the Council and this Parliament. So that next time, Mr. Borrell, you are prepared and have a real chance to tame the beer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Vartmans. The next speaker on the list is Gunnar Beck for two minutes. Thank you, Chair. No plenary in this House without praise for rule of law in the EU and complaints against shortcomings in the rest of the world. Today, Russia is in the dock because of Navalny. We know that. There is money laundering in Russia. There is violation of Navalny's probation. And what has been put forward is justified even though harsh and politically opportune the US is dealing with Edward Snowden in a much different way the EU is breaking its own treaties and has done so since 2012 and does it even today because the parliament has just done that by taking on three quarters of a trillion of debt. Peaceful demonstrations have, however, been clamped down on in Russia. We don't welcome that. 
but these are things we see in the EU too. We've seen it in France against the yellow jackets, the gilets jaunes. It would be helpful if the EU would look at its own shortcomings in the rule of law instead of pointing the finger and moralizing. The EU is not the best in every category and is not free of its own evils. As Voltaire said, everyone should look at themselves first before looking at others. Thank you very much, Mr. Beck. The next speaker on the list is Mr. Butikoffer. He is speaking to us from Berlin for one minute. Colleagues, Mr. Borrell, I really regret having to listen to colleagues in this House from the extreme right and the extreme left that show more understanding for the dictatorship of Putin than for our own democracy. This, I must say, as the first sentence. Your visit to Moscow, Mr. Borrell, was the very opposite of a success. It was a failure. But it is also true that you had been dealt a very bad hand because of the lack of unity in the Council. Russia played foul, so let's stand up to them. I do object to those that now call for your resignation. The dire situation in the EU-Russia relations has deeper roots. Let's not fall into a trap. Your words today, Mr. Borrell, were strong and severe. I hope they will resonate in Berlin and Paris in particular. But you must fight to turn words into deeds, and you will have us as allies. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Butikofer. Now we have Charlie Reimers for one minute. President, High Representative Burrell, in Moscow, Lavrov checkmated you in four moves. You compromised your credibility, damaged your office, and undermined the foreign and security interests of member states. You did not threaten sanctions or harshly condemn the arrest of Navalny, nor did you censure the aggression in the Ukraine or denounce Russia when they declared our diplomats persona non grata. As a Sweden and Northerner, I ask myself, where does this unassertiveness come from? Is it from sheer lack of experience? Is it that Western and Southern trade and gas contracts trump Northern and Eastern security interests? Please answer this. Because for us in the North, this highlights the danger in transferring power over foreign policy to Brussels by abolishing national vetoes. Those that hope that the EU will have their back surely do so in vain. Hi, Representative Burrell, you should resign. We need someone who can play in the grand tournaments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weimers. Now, try and by Sescu for one and a half minutes. Thank you, President. Mr. Burrell, you went to Moscow, but you weren't ready, you weren't prepared for your discussion with Lavrov. In your speech, you just um, spoke in gen generalizations, and I don't think Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok, Vladivostok was well represented. And then you the, didn't tackle the situation with um, Navalny and the demonstrators. And some people asked you questions about uh, uh, Sputnik journalists that were uh, arrested in Latvia. You fell into a trap. There were questions on Cuba. And at the end, you didn't even have the possibility to send out the message that you should have done, which is 
um, the message that the European citizens wanted you to pass on? All questions on uh, bilateral interests, for example, the uh, Eastern Partnership, uh, the situation in the Corsicas, North Africa, migration, the um, disinformation campaigns, all of these issues Um, well, there was absolute silence on all of these issues. Uh, you didn't talk about Ukraine. So the comments that have been made by uh, Mr. Burrell weren't heard by Europeans, but it's because you didn't make any comments. You didn't give any responses. Um, about an unreliable partner for uh, Russia. Then the diplomatic expulsions. There's only one answer to this. We can't have trust in Moscow anymore, but rather those in Eastern Europe who already told you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bashescu. Now we have Sven Mixer for one minute. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. The question today is not whether we need to talk to Russia. Of course we do. The real question today is how we talk and what position we assume when we talk. We need to make sure that we talk with Russia from a position of strength and confidence and, above all, moral authority. We must always remember who we are and who it is we are talking to. We are the European Union. We are a leading promoter in the world of democracy, rule of law and human rights. We are a leading defender of rules-based inter international order. Russia is none of that. It is a country that has only in this century waged two offensive wars against its neighbours and continues to occupy parts of the territory. A country that routinely violates international agreements. A regime that violently suppresses political dissent and peaceful demonstrations. It is a regime whose critics have to fear for their lives, both at home and abroad. We should not ignore that. And we must treat Russia with the same resoluteness we apply to other regimes with a similar track record. Only when our communication with the Kremlin is defined by moral clarity, consistency and unity can we expect to be heard and taken seriously. And this applies in similar measure to the EU as a whole and to individual member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mixer. We now have Elsie Katainen speaking from Helsinki, and she has one minute. Go ahead. President, High Representative, the situation with Russia is difficult. The EU has 6,000 kilometers of border with Russia. And there are discussions and hostilities from Russia towards us. The expulsion of our diplomats is an example thereof. EU-Russian relations are at a low ebb. But we need to keep communication open. Your visit, however, was a disappointment. The Russians won that game. High Representative, it is clear that many answers are expected from you. But it's even more important to ask ourselves, what are the EU's next steps? Will there be further sanctions levied, leading to concrete results? Or should we depend on the next Russian generation and their fight for the rule of law? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Katainen. Now we have Muni Satori for one minute. He's speaking from Paris. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Excellent. Madam President, Mr. Burrell, ladies and gentlemen, facing a Russian power which is mocking democratic rights to a greater extent, here I'd like to express my support for Alexei Navalny and for the civil society which is being repressed but which is courageous nevertheless. Mr. Putin last week wanted to mock Europe as well. The treatment he meted out to our High Representative was indecent. Mr. Burrell, I'm sure your visit should have been planned in a different fashion, but the real problem here facing, uh, facing this provocation is our lack of unity 
and that is why I'm calling for a unity of the 27 member states and targeted sanctions. And that's also why I'm calling on a number of member states, such as Germany, to stop Nord Stream 2. We need to have greater autonomy vis-a-vis -vis Mr. Putin and fossil energies rather than the other way around. So while the oligarchs are enriching themselves, the population is becoming poorer and poorer. We should change this. It should be a priority. Thank you very much, Mr. Satori. Now, Mr. Herman Tetsch, one minute. Thank you, President. Mr. Burrell. First of all, a message to everyone who is here making grotesque, ridiculous comparisons between Mr. Navalny, a persecuted um, dissident, and a series of other um, thieves and um, authors of coup d'etat who are currently carrying out election campaigns. This was in. If it was Russia, they would have been shot for what they did. They would have been shot or put into prisons. Um, so we can't um, compare apples and oranges. Mr. Burrell, um, you went to Moscow to test the waters to see if we could find some kind of understanding despite the um, barbarity committed by the Kremlin, uh, um, the, despite the fact that they have um, incarcerated Mr. Navalny, that they are cracking down on uh, hundreds of demonstrators. You were there. And we have to remember uh, uh, you, how it was in Iran after 1,500 deaths. Uh, and this time it didn't go very well. Mr. Uh, Borrell, uh, it was a failure. Thank you very much, Mr. Tetsch. Now we have Mr. Milan Mon for one and a half minutes. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Borrell, we must speak about Russia again and the tensions between Russia and EU. It's not desirable, given that we have economic and energy ties, but it is as it is. We have made commitments as members of the Council of Europe, and Russia rejects international order and has done over past decades. They don't share our view of pluralist democracy. There is a lack of trust, and there has been little respect but we cannot give up on the liberal international order or on human rights, which are our hallmark. The case of Mr. Navalny has made it clear that we have deep differences with Russia and Moscow. Your visit last week was difficult. Those were testing times, and what was said by Mr. Lavrov was completely unnecessary. The press conference was unfortunate. In these circumstances, it's hard to be optimistic about future EU-Russia ties. The different member state positions, due to historical reasons and due to different economic interests, mean that it will be difficult for the EU to take drastic measures. You have a tough and uphill task ahead of you, Mr. Burrell. Since the Biden administration took office, it doesn't look as though things will improve. In fact, quite the opposite. Thank you very much, Mr. Milan Mon. Now we have Rafael Glucksmann. One minute. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Madam President. Mr. High Representative, your mission to Moscow should bring an end to 20 years of disillusion, uh, because for 20 years we've been hearing the same noises in Paris, in Berlin, and elsewhere for the necessi necessity to uh, 
cooperate with this uh, criminal regime. Putin destroys the Chechens. We should cooperate. Putin carves up Georgia, invades Kuwait. We have to co uh, Ukraine. We have to cooperate. Putin raises Alep, harms and Idlib to the ground. We have to cooperate. He kills uh, Politkovskaya and other opponents and journalists. We should cooperate. Cooperate. He finances movements of the extreme right interfere in our elections. We need to cooperate. When are we going to understand that he doesn't want to cooperate? He despises us for our weakness. He will hit where it, uh, hit, it hurts, and we need to hit where it hurts, hit in his wallet. Let's block the money of the oligarchs. Let's show that we're strong, and only together, and in doing this, will we be respected. Kitos, kollega Glucksmann. Thank you, Mr. Glucksmann. Now, Mr. Nikosimechka, you have one minute. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Farrell, uh, for being here t with us to take stock of uh, what might have well been one of the most ill-advised foreign policy trips in the EU's recent history. Now, I share your view that, that it is important to talk to everyone, including uh, and especially our adversaries or dictators, but without any real leverage, such as a credible form of uh, credible threat of new sanctions or suspension of uh, of Nord Stream 2, this particular diplomatic visit was never going to advance European interests, and many of us have, have warned you of that beforehand. So unfortunately, the trip will not be remembered as a show of support to jailed Russian protesters, but it will be remembered as, as you know, uh, a moment where the EU's credibility was weakened, particularly because of uh, the performance of Sergei Lavrov on the press conference. The best we can hope for now is that it will also be remembered as a moment, as a wake-up call, uh, that finally prompted EU member states and yourself uh, to, to adopt a more realistic and principled Russian foreign policy and to move uh, toward sanctions finally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shimechka. Now we have Jakob de Lunde, one minute. Thank you very much, Madam President. Europe's neighbourhood is on fire. We see mass uh, uh, arrests of protesters, peaceful protesters in Russia. We see police brutality in Belarus, and we see other problems in this area of the world. Now, we have to do everything to defend these defenders of uh, democracy in our neighbourhood and stop those who try to stifle democracy. But today we cannot do that completely. In foreign policy, Europe is being held back because of our dependence on fossil fuels, imported gas, uranium as well, and other fuels. Uh, Germany's uh, dubious behaviour on Nord Stream is an example there. We have to free ourselves from these pipelines and really invest in getting us independent of Putin's uh, energy supply. As long as we're dependent on Russian energy, we cannot have a completely independent and efficient foreign policy. Hence, we have to fight for 100% renewable energy and support democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dalunda. Now we have Ms. Sisto Kanko, one minute. Uh, Mr. I had to ask that. I have to ask where your head was at this particular point. It was a complete disaster. Everybody knew that Moscow, going to Moscow was a mistake. But you went nevertheless. You were warned that Lavrov would lead you up the garden path. How come you couldn't see that? You went unprepared to a press conference as well and on that occasion you basically shot yourself twice in the foot first by uh, attacking our allies and secondly by talking about the Sputnik vaccine as being good before Europe had approved it. The leader of our political EU should know that 
Russia would use its vaccine in the way it uses its energy as a weapon to divide us. The EU will never be taken seriously as long as we only react with words. Autocrats only respect deeds. Hence, Mr. Borrell, there's only one way in which you could r sort out this disaster, come with a, a comprehensive package to sanction Putin's kleptocracy, do it now, or move over for a high representative who will do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kanko. Now, Peter van Dalen, one and a half minutes. Voorzitter, wat Rusland betreft. Well, when it comes to Russia, so many people here know that the real criminal is actually the one leading in Moscow. So we require a strong European response and very strong actions. Now, that's something I found lacking, Mr. Borrell, last week. You didn't go there to tell Putin what to do. No, on the contrary, our transatlantic ally in Washington was uh, told that they were doing the wrong thing in Cuba. Moreover, something I didn't see in the press conference either, you weren't asking about the Russian occupation of the Crimea. You didn't talk about the outrageous Russian behaviour to uh, get in the way of the investigation into MH118. You didn't talk about the sanctions which are necessary because for a long time Russia has been trampling human rights underfoot. What did we hear in the press conference? Well, praising of the Sputnik vaccine. Well, President, seldom have we been so scandalized. And during the course of the press conference, Moscow really stuck up its middle finger to Mr. Burrell and the EU by expelling three EU diplomats. I would expect a more powerful uh, uh, EU high representative in your place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Dalen. Mr. Andres Schieder for one minute now. Thank you, Frau Thank you, Chair. High Representative, ties between the EU and Russia have reached a low ebb. Why? Because Russia doesn't comply with basic human rights. Russia breaks international law. Navalny has been put in jail, as have protesters. Belarus, Ukraine, the list goes on. Was it important to travel to Moscow? Yes, because we need dialogue and diplomacy. Alas, Russia showed it is not interested in dialogue. That's the core problem. What we now need is a European strategy. We must move forwards together and in a determined way. Together and determined. We need to implement goals and sanctions to prevent money laundering and to deal with oligarchs. We should also have a serious discussion about projects such as Nord Stream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shida. Now, Mr. Petrus Antovicius, one minute. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Mr. Borrell, dear colleagues, during your AFET hearings two years ago, you, Mr. Borrell, committed to working for a stronger Europe in the world, a global player. You promised a truly integrated EU's foreign policy which combines positions of the Member States, the Commission and this Parliament. After your visit to Moscow, the EU is being portrayed as weak. The EU is being called an unreliable partner. The visit was organized without the proper preparations to prevent traps set by the Kremlin and went under complete Russian script. The collateral damage 
and disappointment about the visit is really massive. Maybe it is easiest to explain through the perspective of EU citizens, those inquiries full of regret and criticism about the EU not being able to meet their expectations I receive. I struggle to provide my fellow EU citizens with a reasonable explanation why the first diplomat of the European Union went to Moscow against the advice of several member states and this parliament, particularly when the visit failed to open the doors to freedom of Alexei Navalny and the halt the violence against peaceful protesters in Russia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Austerichius. Now, Mr. Patrick Yaki, one minute. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Madam President. I think it's time to end up with this theater, with this hypocrisy, because uh, in your words, uh, you condemn Putin. Yes, he's trying to poison his opponents. Uh, he's attacking uh, neighbors, his neighbors. He's creating a totalitarian system which destroys freedoms. But when it comes to actions, you are doing something exactly opposite. You built Nord Stream 2, which not only damages European values, but also gives him a tool to blackmail other countries. And uh, the chief of EU the diplomacy goes to Moscow when Navalny is being sentenced. So we should make up our minds. Either you uh, support solidarity and freedom, or you support Putin's interest. And dear Europe, it's enough with the theater here. Stop Nord Stream true, or stop talking about values, actions and not words, dear Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yaki. Now, Andreas Kubilius, one and a half minutes. Mr. Vice President, dear colleagues, Putin regime gave us a lesson and we should be grateful for that. It is evident that EU policy towards Russia should go through a deep strategic revision. I prepared a list of 10 major points for review of the strategy with immediate, medium-term and longer-term actions. First point, no more illusions about Putin regime. Putin will not be different, but Russia can become different. Second, the EU has to impose immediate sanctions on those from the regime who are responsible for Navalny case. Third, the EU immediately has to stop the Nord Stream 2 project. Fourth, the EU has to move in relations with Russia from Putin first to democracy first paradigm. Fifth, EU should put defense of democracy at the same priority level as the fight against climate change. Sixth, EU needs to agree with the new US administration that the global defense of democracy should be top priority. Seventh, before Russian Duma elections, introduction of new type of preventive sanctions against stealing and bribing elections. Eighth, launch of the justice hubs for the people of Belarus and Russia on the territory of EU countries. And ninth, much larger scale EU investments into success of Eastern partnership countries, which can inspire Russian people. And tenth, EU needs to have strategic vision of its future relations with democratic Russia, which, would cause, which could also inspire Russian people. Based on these 10 points, the EU can change its policy on Russia. EU policy change will help Russia to change itself. Thank you very much, Mr. Kubilius. Now, Robert Piedron, one minute. Madam President, High Commissioner, when mass protests broke out in Belarus, we drew attention to the fact that there is too much talk and not enough action from the EU regarding, of course, foreign policy. Even if we had best diplomats, there is little they could do because of the lack of unanimous approach towards Russia. The new EU sanctions mechanism should be revised by deleting the unanimity rule in the Council. We need also to enlarge the sectional, uh, sectional restrictive measures against the Russian Federation.
The European Union cannot remain idle in the face of all human rights violations in Russia. What we need is a new horizontal strategy towards Russia. What we need is a common, firm approach towards Russia. This is what we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Biedron. Now we have Umas Pait. One minute. Dear Chairman, dear colleagues, the role of High Representative is to interact and engage with his counterparts from other countries, even in difficult times and on problematic topics. But this visit to Moscow had an extremely bad timing. Despite EU calls on Russia to refrain from arresting opposition leader Navalny and to stop the harassment of demonstrators, Russia behaves exactly the opposite. And the EU is advised to keep its mouth shut. By expelling EU diplomats on the same day as the visit and by publicly stating that the EU is not a reliable partner, Russia has confirmed once again that it does not wish to mend the relations with the EU. And the EU must build on this knowledge. The level of naivety towards Russia and Europe should be kept low. Russia has made its geopolitical choices for now. Hopefully, the EU will draw quick conclusions about what happened. Among others, the inclusion of human rights violators on the sanctions list and the suspension of Nord Stream 2, which is contrary to European energy security policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mrs. Krok, one minute, please. Madam President, one of the uh, biggest humiliations in the history of the European Union, a sad performance. Uh, just a few of uh, the reactions uh, that after the visit of uh, Mr. Borrell in Moscow. Uh, Poland and the Baltic states uh, warned against uh, going to Moscow. You didn't listen. Uh, why? Because there are no experts in uh, your cabinet uh, on Eastern Europe? Or is it uh, Germany and France that uh, want to further their interests at the cost of other member states? You overestimated your uh, capabilities. Uh, it is pride uh, that uh, is the problem. This time uh, the Union uh, got what it deserves. Uh, what uh, conclusions should be drawn? The only uh, the President interrupts. We should stop Nord Stream 2. Thank you very much. Now Mrs. Zovko, one and a half minutes. President, High Representative, as a former diplomat, I deeply regret the expulsion of a three European diplomats by the Russian Federation. This decision is completely unfounded. Why do we have a Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations? A diplomat is entitled to assess the developments in the receiving state and to report to the government of the sending state. When diplomats are hindered by a state, to objectively observe a democratic protest, profound questions can be posed on the functioning of that state, on the compliance with the rule of law, on the respect for democracy and human rights. Our relations with Russia are at the low point. A European strategic approach is more than necessary. We must prevent further deterioration, show readiness to respond with sanctions, but also willingness to rebuild ways towards renewed dialogue. Please, let diplomacy do its job, because we know what happens when diplomacy ends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. 
High representatives Joseph Borrell's visit to Russia last week has, has raised a lot of doubts. It is obvious that the aggressive Kremlin's policy is not appreciated by the Russian people and a testimony to that are pre mass protests, whereas the poisoning of Navalny and his jailing for three years is a blatant violation of the international law and an example of political crackdown. We see ourselves that the Kremlin is further trying to undermine and eliminate any dissent or opposition. The Kremlin has abused the European Union and our image and expelled three diplomats from Russia. At the joint press conference, Mr. Borrell, you should have uh, expressed a demand to release Alexei, Alexei Navalny. And also you had to react to the statements by Russian foreign minister on the annexation of Crimea and other issues on which we in the European, European Parliament have a clear position. However, we did not hear any stronger position expressed in Moscow. We now demand tough and targeted sanctions. And I would like to urge those EU member states which tend to overlook Russia's aggression to see what's happening at the border of the EU. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Madam Karin Karlspro, one minute. Madam President, Mr. Burrell, last week you went to Russia. You went to Mr. Putin, who's just thrown his most uh, worthy opponent into prison. You went to Russia that has locked up more than a thousand protesters. You went with empty hands and unprepared. In Moscow, it should have been obvious that the EU would strengthen sanctions, sanctions tighten the screw, that they would uh, condemn the trampling of human rights, the threats to protesters, that Alexei Navalny must be liberated, that cooperation such as Nord Stream 2 should be stopped. All of these things are things that Mr. Putin doesn't like, but we don't like Mr. Putin's policy. At the same time, amongst other things, a Swedish diplomat was expelled from Russia. So this visit cannot be described as anything else than a fiasco. A lot went wrong in Moscow. The first mistake, however, was to take that trip at all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now Mr. Uh, Antonio Lopez is tourist white for one minute, 30 seconds. Senor Borrell, eh. Mr. Borrell, what happened should serve as a guide for future uh, discussions with um, Venezuela, Cuba, and so forth. Um, we have to stick to our principles and values of the European um, uh, Union. Now, we've seen in the history uh, fascist communism, extreme right, who are financed by um, uh, regimes like the one in Russia at the moment. In my own country, in Spain, Pablo Iglesias has uh, financed Venezuela and Iran and is now uh, a spokesperson for the Putin regime and undermining the democratic system that we uh, uh, spent to achieve it. Now in Spain, we can't take a step back uh, front, uh, faced with Russian interference um, in what's happening in Spain and in Catalonia. Mr. Borrell. You have to support the Russian opposition, uh, the democratic opposition in Russia. And the only way to achieve this is sanctions now. A lot of uh, colleagues have talked about uh, Mr. Borrell, but what about sanctions? They are much more effective. And we have to clearly, in the next European Council, stay who is in favour of this and where consensus is when we're imposing sanctions on Russia. And we have to say that publicly, and those who oppose it have to say it publicly, um, so that we can um, make it clear to European public opinion. Together with the new North American um, uh, government, we have to work to defend our values. Thank you so much. Uh, now, um, Mr. Ero Heinel Woma for one minute. Good colleagues have arvostelleet korkea edustaja Borrelia siitä, että hän meni Moskva. Thank you very much. There have been criticisms leveled at Mr. Borrell because of his trip to Moscow, but he is the high representative. 
he has done the work that he is responsible for. The EU's message was sent to Moscow. We speak out against the poisoning of Navalny and his imprisonment. We ask for human rights to be respected. We need to move forward along those lines in a determined way. It's clear that Russia has moved away from European values. And that means something. It means that the discussion on human rights and sanctions needs to happen again. And we need to have a new mechanism that will enable us to impose individual sanctions. We need to move forward with determination and we need to do the right thing and we shouldn't attack our commissioner. Madam Frederic Ries for one minute. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Thank you, Madam President. C'est un dicton populaire. That's what they say in Russia, and has been heard in Russia and in Moscow. Uh, its translation is, if you risk things, you can often risk being mocked. Well, sometimes it's difficult to say. This was a fiasco that was announced ahead of time uh, by us as well. The trap that Putin and Lavrov set is fairly vicious. We're always in favor of dialogue, but your trip to Moscow really didn't advance Alexei Navalny's case one iota, nor the case of human rights in Russia. And you said, and I was listening very attentively to you, you said you talked to the Russians. Well, yes, it's essential. Uh, that is really the, the nub of the issue. Speaking to the Russians, speaking to the young people, the thousands who are on the streets, who need to know what's going on with Putin in power. But I'm just wondering what is spoiling things at the moment. I've only got 10 uh, seconds. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. But if you were between a rock and a hard place, between your ambition, I'm sure, our ambition, and the reticence of member states, all this to say that it is the function of the high representative, I understand, Madam President, that I'm out of time, that is imperative. It has to be reinvented by the Conference for a Future on Europe. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Bilczyk, uh, for one and a half minutes, please. Madam President, uh, High Representative, uh, it is uh, with regret and a sense of shame that I stand here today speaking of last week's events. Unfortunately, Mr. Borrell, uh, your visit to Russia has demonstrated that reaching out to Moscow under current circumstances is not only futile, it is dangerous. The last thing we need to hear from a European politician speaking in Moscow today is a criticism of our ally in Washington. When I see the frustration of the Belarusian and Russian people and the unstoppable force of Lukashenko's and Putin's regimes, I expect from the representative of European diplomacy clear messages about sanctions, political prisoners, disinformation, Russia's dirty money, and its, it, and its attempts to undermine the European way of life. I want to convey my sincere support to those fighting for democracy and fundamental rights in the streets of Minsk, Moscow and other cities and towns across Belarus and Russia. Russia is a regime that kills and jails its political opponents. The European Union cannot engage with it in a manner of business as usual. And by the way, our messages to Russia also have foreign policy implications for actions in our neighborhood and in the Western Balkans. Believe me, the fight for European hearts and minds of our neighbors will be easier with clear red lines towards Moscow. I wish, sincerely, we did not need to have this debate today, for Europe's biggest opponent in our relations to Russia sits in Moscow. Let us not give him any more comfort. Let's stand up to Russia's dark side, united, and in clear defense of Europe's values and interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Mrs. Shoydrava for one and a half minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, there is, um, it's almost as cold in Brussels as in Moscow. But that doesn't mean that we should shake in front of Tsar Batushka Putin. Mr. High Representative, 
let me simply state that you haven't been f well prepared for the trip and you have underestimated Russian reality. Maybe you had the vision of establishing a constructive dialogue called for by so some countries. However, it's time to be honest. Your visit has shown that Russia, with its current leadership, is not a trustworthy partner because Putin sees an enemy in us. Instead of uh, having to justify their violent suppression of democratic opposition um, uh, and arresting students, the uh, foreign minister pontificated us on how EU democracy, democracy is supposed to look. And you have, were only watching to the, the expulsion of EU diplomats. Of course, we can't just criticize you because we have a common goal. We have missed the opportunity to show a clear path for the future and a real partnership and dialogue. And this starts with a release of political prisoners and free elections. That's a sh that has to be our condition. Our today's c uh, discussion has to be what to do in order that this future happens. You have admitted that your trip wasn't successful and I appreciate that. The EU also has to draw its lessons, it has to wake up, it has to uh, impose sanctions against persons responsible for Navalny's arrest, stop Nord Stream 2 and support the democratic direction of Eastern Partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Madame Yuknevicjene, one and a half minute. Even before the visit to Moscow, it was clear that Kremlin would mock. However, today I think the visit was needed. Why? After the Black Friday in Moscow, the different understanding must come in the EU. Putin will not change. Russia will change, but not Putin. First of all, we need to stop thinking of Russia as Putin's Russia. We need to think about the people in Russia. Putin is the biggest threat to the Russian people. Putin is the world's largest Russophobe because he is afraid Russians. The change in EU policy must aim for changes in Russia. After decades of dreaming of Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok, we must realize that such Europe is impossible if we built it with the Kremlin regime. A democratic Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok without Lukashenko, without Putin, is a dream I support. Mr. Borrell, in order to help Russians, it's not needed to travel to meet Putin. We need to sit down at the same table with our partners in Washington, D.C. and make a common plan for the democracy. It includes Putin's containment strategy, not assistance. If we do not learn from the bitter lessons of Mr. Borrell, our fight against disinformation or interferences will be a fight against windmills and our citizens will not longer respect this union of democracies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now, Mr. Rio Terras, one and a half minute. Thank you, Madam President, Mr. Vice President of the Commission. Your visit to Moscow, as you've heard, has received a lot of negative attention. I believe you are very well aware of everything that concerns your visit to Moscow because you were at the epicenter of these unfortunate events. But for the record and to end this debate, let's see what were the main missteps that brought your actions or, and mainly lack of action into the public's sharp interest. The timing of your visit was extremely inappropriate, given the ongoing repressions of the Putin regime against the Russian people. With your visit, you symbolically accepted the brutal behavior of the Russian authorities as something normal. With, at the joint press conference with the Russian foreign minister, you made false claims that there is no interest or initiative among the EU member states in, in imposing additional sanctions against Russia. You did not defend the interests of the EU, 
nor did you clearly oppose the Russian foreign minister's attacks, which targeted at targeted the EU and our ally, the United States. You did not protect uh, the interests of the European Union, nor did you end your visit after receiving information about the expulsion of uh, European Union diplomats from Russia. Mr. Borrell, I hope you understand your mistakes and their impact on the European Union and that you will draw your own conclusions from them and act accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, now I give the floor to the Vice President, uh, High Representative, uh, Mr. Joseph Borel Fonteles. I give you the floor. Thank you. I'm going to speak Spanish. After all, it's the second most spoken language in the world, and we have a very good interpretation system. So I will use my own language. Bien, muchas gracias. Por Thank you for all of your comments and all of your observations. Um, they differed rather. There was quite a broad uh, range of interpretations of my visit and uh, the relationships between the EU and Russia. I've taken note of your comments and we will take them into account in preparing future debates in the External Action Service and preparing councils. However, if I may, I I would like to say that when I listen to some of you, my, is, my impression is that uh, uh, it, it was me that expelled the European diplomats, um, that it was my fault that uh, the diplomats were expelled. Uh, uh, apologies, but it was Mr. Lavrov who expelled the diplomats. Was it a reaction to my public um, comments on the Navalny case? Maybe. But I think you all have to agree who did it. And then I heard uh, uh, some of you are saying things about whether or not we should have done the press conference. They just your comments don't reflect reality. Um, that's not how things were. In the uh, radio uh, and press conference, it's very clear. I say twice to Mr. Lavrov that I was there and in our meeting that we are more than concerned, we are against the um, rulings that are being handed down against Mr. Navalny and uh, the um, attacks on him and the um, demonstrations that, this, that were led to in civil society. I said this twice at the beginning, at the end. So how can you come here and say that I didn't raise the issue of Mr. Navalny or that I didn't defend his position or defend uh, public demonstrations? Uh, we're not talking about the same thing. There's a transcript. Please read it. So what's the problem here? For some of you, the problem seems to be that the visit took place, that it happened that the High Representative decided to carry out a, a visit to Moscow. Do you know how many times uh, official delegations at ministerial level or above have taken place to Russia in the last two years by EU member states? Nineteen. Nineteen times there have been visits to Russia. So. Should we go, should we not go? Or can everyone go apart from the High Representative? So what, my colleagues can go, but I can't. 19 visits there have been, 19 times. It, you know, it's not uh, forbidden, it's not so strange to go. It seems to be fairly normal, 19 times. The problem, Perhaps it was the wrong time, 
okay, there are differences of opinion on this. Some people think it was the wrong time because of the ruling against Mr. Navalny, and others might think that it was precisely because of that that, that it was the right time to go in order to clearly, directly, and personally set out our position. It's very, well, it's easier to stay at my desk writing statements. It would have been uh, much le less risky and more comfortable. I, I don't think it's so strange, however, to think that this was the right time to do it. Uh, people were saying, oh, no, it's too risky. No, it's better not to go, or, or not to go now, go later when uh, Mr. Navalny had already, had, uh, had already been sentenced. Well, my view is different and uh, has the support of the majority of the Foreign Affairs Council. Uh, there was a majority in favor. Uh, to me, it seems like, and it still seems that um, for human rights defenders and those uh, and uh, defending uh, those who fight for human rights is in our DNA. We have to uh, make it clear that uh, this is our position. Has this um, been damaging to the opposition in Russia? Has it undermined the position of Mr. Navalny? I, I don't understand why it would have done. Now, perhaps we could discuss at the time at which we were publicly setting out our positions, that things could have been done differently or should have been done differently. Of course, um, there are different interpretations. And uh, in the general view, it seems like I should have uh, tackled it differently. But I don't see a press conference as a debate or some kind of dispute. I was explaining my position, and, and I repeat it. Um, I transmitted the message that I went to put across that the European Union is um, profoundly disagrees and condemns the attempted assassination of Mr. Navalny, uh, the sentences against him, and the pressure on civil society and on the demonstrators, the activists. I said that and I've repeated it. That's the message I went to give. Yet despite this, there are areas where we could possibly imagine cooperation that would be, be beneficial to both parties. Um, some people say that in the DCPOA, I'm uh, supporting the Russian position um, and undermining the United States. Um, uh, if you can critic, you can criticize me, but do it in a justified way. Don't invent things just to justify your own criticisms. Um, we're trying to keep the treaty um, up and running, and despite what had happened in the United States. Um, in Russia, it said that they're trying to uh, stand firm against them. And uh, when I've discussed this, um, we're told that we're a puppet of the United States, and that will always condemn uh, what Russia does, but never what uh, the United States do, because they're our allies, and that way I'll have double standards. We are allies of the United States, but this doesn't mean that we we're 100 percent behind them on every single position that they take and every single decision that they make. There are some cases where we disagree. Uh, we have to say that, and we do say that. When we believe that it's necessary and convenient to do so, we say so. Now, some of you seem to be quite surprised by this because you seem to have a rather one-sided view. Um, but I'm not uh, xenophobic against anyone. We have to uh, stand with someone when, it, when it's right and set out a firm position when that's necessary. Now, you might say this was the wrong time to do so. I can understand that the result wasn't as hoped. And now we have to accept and admit that the media view and the majority view in this chamber seems to be that it wasn't the right thing to do. But was that because I shouldn't have gone in the first place or that I should have gone later? 
Is it because we didn't uh, discuss the topics that we wanted to discuss? Because we didn't defend uh, Mr. Navalny and his position? There are a whole series of different events of uh, facts that have to be analyzed one by one. Um, but we can't just uh, lay the blame and say that the only beneficiary was the Kremlin. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about is acting with unity and determination. Autocratic author authoritarian countries believe that democracies are intin intrinsically weak because of uh, because of being democratic. But de history shows this isn't the case. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the uh, um, Soviet Union, we've shown that democracies are stronger, we're more resilient, because we have um, a unity uh, that lies above and beyond our differences. In this case, as in others, what we have to do, both before and after my uh, mission to Russia, is to build unity between member states and unity of action f with the US. And we have to work on that now in the Foreign Affairs Council. Under the guidance and, and uh, of the um, European Council, we have to make it clear what our position is towards Russia. And, and of course, we have to talk to them as well. The issue of human rights and the Navalny case in particular, when that is raised, the Russians say, well, we're not going to talk about it, the end. We have to see some kind of uh, mediation, but we can't say that it was uh, uh, very clear. For Russia, someone went there clearly, directly, personally said what we've said in our statements uh, many times now. I don't think uh, that it was wrong to go and say to them face to face what we say in writing. I think it was the right time to use all of our strength, all of our um, force and the strength of the physical presence of the high representative to um, set out our position on the Navalny case. Um, despite any other uh, shortcomings, I think if we believe that uh, civil liberties and human rights are at the heart of our political uh, union, then the situation of Navalny um, um, it requires our clear, strong presence. Uh, now, some people weren't happy to see me uh, continue discussions with Mr. Lavrov and uh, have uh, discussions on issues, um, including the Navalny case. Um, I mean, he, there was an attempted assassination, and there are a whole series of rulings uh, against him. And now we're comparing that to some members who sit in this chamber or other um, colleagues who are freely campaigning in Catalonia at the moment. Do you think that is a sensible comparison? It's clear that it's not, quite clearly. But I'm not going to get into this discussion. I just want to repeat once again the message that I went there to pass on. The European Union protests, condemns, um, asks for uh, investigations into the, situa the um, circumstances uh, uh, that occurred around Mr. Navalny and that we believe that uh, this was an, un an, an unjust uh, ruling. We uh, urge respect of the rights and uh, the human rights of Russian citizens. These are the topics on which it's necessary and inevitable to search for cooperation. However, to cooperate, you need two sides. If the Russian authorities don't want to do that, then we take note and we will try to find another way to uh, move forward with the relationship. Despite everything, I think we did manage to achieve some positive points in the visit. It could have been better, but um, we know uh, we have a better idea of what we're dealing with and what to expect. I think 
what we have to do now in the European institutions, the Council, the Parliament, the Commission, is to uh, uh, clearly and calmly analyse what future steps we should take in the relationship with Russia. And I hope this debate has contributed to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I close the debate.